Hey guys, so I had some good feedback on the last video and I wanted to make one more just to kind of uh, transition from like the basics of EKG, like access interpretation and all that, and kind of move it into more of a clinical scenario. Um, we did some clinical cases on Friday, which I feel like we're kind of advanced um, right after just learning the basics of EKG interpretation. So I'm going to transition uh, this into some basic clinical cases like we did on Friday, um, and hopefully this will help preparing for Friday's session when we start doing arrhythmia interpretation um, and just, we continue to manage, like, you know, correlate it to actual patients. So this is life in the fast lane. I've recommended this to a lot of people. I used it a ton when I was learning EKGs. Um, they used to be at lifeinthefastlane.com. Now they've transitioned more to litfl.com, which is just easier. Um, so if you go to this website, uh, you can do more of them later, but I'm just going to work through roughly 10 or so. Um, so go on the homepage, click uh, top 100 and then click top 100 ECG clinical cases. On the ECG library section, you can go to ECG basics and there's a ton of good stuff, but for now we're just gonna go through the cases. So top 100 ECG clinical cases. And we'll start with number one. So this is a middle-aged patient presenting with chest pain and diaphoresis. The blood pressure dropped to 80 over 50 following sublingual nitrates. So they're kind of spoon feeding you the answer here. Um, so middle-aged patient, whether it be male or female, presenting with chest pain, and diaphoresis. This is a bad combo already. So they're having chest pain and they're excessively sweating. Their blood pressure dropped to 80 over 50 following sublingual nitro. Um, so this, you can already kind of think about what it would be without even seeing the EKG. Um, but then when you see the EKG, it should become fairly obvious to you. Um, so remember, SALI is our acronym. So S is here, V1 and V2 are septum. V3, V4 is the A, which is uh, anterior. V5, V6 is lateral. 1 in AVL is high lateral, and 2, 3 in AVF is the inferior portion of the heart. SALI is that acronym, S-A-L-L-I. So we're looking at the EKG in different sections. So 2, 3 in AVF are representing the inferior portion of the heart. And yeah, we have that like, um, you know, that, that system or the algorithm I kind of worked through last time where we're looking at the P waves and the PR interval, the axis, et cetera, rate, rhythm. Uh, but when you glance at this, a few things should stand out to you immediately. Um, the rate is okay. There's, there's nothing severely high or severely low about that. But what is standing out quickly is these ST elevations. So 2, 3 AVF have these 3-ish uh, three, three millimeter to 4 millimeter ST elevations, which is very large. And then the opposite of the inferior leads is the high lateral leads, which is 1 in AVL. So 2, 3 AVF is inferior. The reciprocal or opposite area uh, is 1 in AVL, which is high lateral. So there's ST elevations in, in inferior leads. There's reciprocal changes of ST depression in the uh, high lateral leads. If you look at the baseline here, the TP segment, and you go all the way down here. This is the ST segment. So some pretty significant changes here. Um, so this is going to be an inferior STEMI. Uh, you can also see some ST elevations in V1 and V2 and even V3, which is pretty bad as well. So if we go down, uh, this website gives you a really good interpretation. So general sinus rhythm, rate is 84, normal axis, borderline first degree AV block. If you look at the PN PR interval, it's pretty long. But again, this isn't the most important things about this. Now, there are signs of an inferior STEMI. There's ST elevation, inferior leads, 2, 3 AVF, like I said. Um, there's reciprocal ST depressions in 1 AVL and V6. So this is 1 in AVL. And if you look over here, there's also ST depressions here. Now, remember, V6 is the furthest uh, like left-sided lead that you're putting on the chest, which is very lateral. And on the axis, 1 AVL are also left-sided leads. So they're going to look very similar as far as the ST segment. Uh, signs of associated right ventricular infarction. Uh, so we have ST elevation in 3 is greater than 2, 3 is greater than 2, and then we also have the ST elevation in V1 and V2. Think about where you're putting those on the chest. Those are kind of close to the right ventricle. Um, so what you can do is you can take V4 and you can move it from the right, uh, the left side of the chest, mirror it over to the right side of the chest, and now you're really directly measuring the right ventricle myocardium. Uh, so when they do the V4R, you print it out, you scratch out V4, or you just notify that it is a V4R, and you have ST elevation. So this is definitely an inferior STEMI of the right coronary artery, uh, specifically including the right ventricle, which is really bad. And the reason the blood pressure drops with the sublingual nitro is because it's dropping preload. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all we need to talk about for this one. Uh, there's more clinical pearls, uh, which basically just say the patients are preload sensitive and may have an exaggerated hypotensive episode uh, or response relative to nitrates. So next one. Okay, so this is a really, really good one. So this is a really scary EKG, right? So first thing is rate. Obviously, there's a lot of beats going on in this 10-second um, period. So we know this patient is severely tachycardic. So we know it's a very tachycardic patient. So next thing is, is it regular or is it irregular? 
Um, well, if you just look at like these, it looks fairly regular. But look here, there's this big gap. There's a very small gap. There's a medium sized gap, a few mediums, a long gap. Uh, and here, they're, they're kind of the same. You can tell this one's very short, this one's medium. These are long again. So this is an irregular rhythm, all right? So this is an irregular rhythm and it's tachycardic. So what do you think it could be at this point? So irregular rhythm, you should already be thinking atrial fibrillation with a tachycardic uh, rhythm or tachycardic rate. We would call that AFib RVR, or atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Um, now this is also a narrow complex tachycardia. It's not wide complex. If it was wide complex, you might be thinking that it's ventricular tachycardia, uh, but ventricular tachycardia is not typically going to be irregular. It's almost always regular. So right now we have a narrow complex, um, a narrow complex tachycardia that is irregular, right? So what else do we notice about this? Um, well, let's look at the, like the uh, clinical context first. This is a 20-year-old female, 20-year-old female presenting with palpitations and presyncope. Her blood pressure is very low, 75 over 50. So 20-year-old female. So a 20-year-old female, although they absolutely can have an MI, likely not an MI, um, what type of arrhythmias are 20-year-old females prone to? Well, possibly atrial fibrillation. Um, and we talked about this one specific arrhythmia in class of uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White. So if we look, it's very hard to tell because the rate is so fast. But if you look, this QRS is slurring up. It's not just going up, it's slurring up. It has a curve to it. Uh, if we can look at some others, maybe we can see it better. And it's very difficult to see, but there's a slight slurring up there. But if you have a very tachycardic atrial fibrillation, you need to suspect Wolf Parkinson White, especially in a young person. Um, so if we go down and we read the uh, interpretation from the website, it's an irregularly irregular, which is AFib, broad complex tachycardia. So yeah, this is technically, I mean, it's like, on the verge of broad. It's about 110 to 120 milliseconds. Uh, so actually you wouldn't call this narrow, but uh, it, it's not exactly wide either. Like ventricular tachycardia would be very wide. So this is a borderline of broad. Um, extremely rapid ventricular rates up to 300 beats per minute in places. So like right around here, if it was staying at this RR interval the entire time, it would be like roughly 300 beats per minute. But if you average this out, I'm not gonna do that right now, but if you counted all these and multiplied it by six, it's probably like 250 beats per minute on average, which is super fast. Uh, beat to beat variability. So that's what we were talking about. The RR interval is not the same throughout. So it's definitely irregular. Um, so uh, explanation of the findings, irregular, irregular rhythm is consistent with AFib. There's a left bundle branch block morphology to QRS complexes, which there is. However, the ventricular rate is far too rapid for this simply to be AFib with left bundle branch block. Uh, you can go to the PowerPoint and look at what a left, left bundle branch block would look like. It's roughly going to look like this in V1 through 3, and it's going to transition to V4 through 6. Uh, essentially, the T waves are going to go away from the QRS with a widened QRS, which is what you see here. Um, where were we? And then the rates of 250 to 300 and the variability in QRS complex morphology indicate the existence of an accessory pathway between the atrium and ventricle. So remember, Wolf Parkinson White is when there's the bundle of Kent instead of the AV node, um, or in addition to the AV node. And these uh, rapid, random, like atrial depolarizations or, or fibrillations, I should say, that are causing AFib are they're able to go through that bundle of Kent. Um, so the AFib. Now the atria in AFib is, is, is fibrillating at a rate of like 300 to 600 times per minute, I believe. Um, and some of them are getting through the AV node causing uh, AFib RVR or tachycardia with AFib. So that's, that's okay. But if it's getting up to rates like this, that means that there's a bundle of Kent likely that's able to transmit a lot more of those rates through. Um, so that's why you can get these super dangerous uh, tachycardias that go up to 300 beats per minute with both Parkinson White. Um, so that's pretty much all we need to know here. Clinical pearls, they go more into it, basically just saying cardioverted. I'm not going to go into too many clinical pearls on this just because it take a while. All right, last, uh, let's see, case number three. So a middle-aged diabetic patient presenting with shortness of breath, clinical evidence of pulmonary edema. So this is definitely a tough one. So super low QRS voltage. It's very hard to even see the QRS, much less the P wave or anything. Uh, what do we notice first? This is a bradycardic patient. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's only six complexes on the whole thing times uh, times six. So this is a roughly a rate of like 35, 36. So that's definitely bad. Um, ST segments, they all look fine. There's no ST elevations or depressions. Um, so at a rate this low, you might be thinking, oh, this is an escape rhythm by the ventricles. Well, if you look like, yeah, the QRS is a little wide, but this doesn't look like a ventricular escape rhythm really. Um, what about the T waves? So this is these are kind of peaked looking, right? They're not super tall, 
but they're they're symmetrical, they're tall, they're narrow. Um, so this is kind of concerning for peak T waves. Um, that's about all I can see. Now, if you look for P waves, I don't see any P waves, right? I don't. But is it regular or is it irregular? Well, this is a pretty big gap. This is a pretty short gap, and they all kind of stay the same. But it looks like it's, you know, the RR intervals are not the same. So we could definitely call this slow AFib maybe. Um, or it could just be a sinus rhythm, but we just can't see the P waves. And there's a little bit of irregularity due to other reasons. So that we're kind of between slow AFib and sinus bradycardia with possibly some electrolyte abnormalities. But if we add everything up, um, we have slightly widened QRS. We have some peak looking T waves. We have an absence of P waves. Um, so peak looking T waves, absence of P waves. And then we look at the clinical context again. You know, you always got to keep that in mind. Middle aged diabetic patient, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema. So probably hyperkalemia. So severe bradycardia, um, slow AFib, can't see the P waves. Uh, this says there are some small voltage P waves in V1, V2. Let's look. So I guess maybe this tiny little guy is a P wave. That tiny little blip there is P wave. But I mean, that's not something, yeah, I guess that, that you can consider that a P wave. Remember, these are super, super small voltage. So since you can see these tiny little P waves, you start to think, oh, this is sinus. Um, and if you have a severe bradycardia with a sinus rhythm, that's definitely concerning for like electrolyte ab abnormalities. So tenting of the T waves, uh, this combination of bradycardia, flattening and loss of P waves, QRS broadening and T wave abnormalities is highly suspicious for severe hyperkalemia. And the uh, potassium is eight, which is huge. Um, so we can move on from that. This one is really advanced. You can look it up if you want, but it's definitely out of the scope of what we're doing right now. It's from like a antidepressant overdose. All right, this is a really good one. So case five, the following sequence of EKGs is taken from a middle-aged patient presenting with chest pain and diaphoresis, excessive sweating. Can you interpret each EKG tracing in the context of the patient's symptom? So remember EKGs, they're great, but on their own, they're not the best. There's obviously ones like the first inferior STEMI we saw. If you saw it with no clinical context, you'd be really concerned for a STEMI. However, most of these you're really need, gonna need to know like the patient's clinical context. So again, middle-aged patient, chest pain, diaphoresis. First thing in your mind should be acute coordination syndrome or an occlusion uh, leading to an MI. So this is the first EKG, chest pain and diaphoresis. What do we see here? So take five seconds and look. Okay, so the paramedic or whoever took this EKG wrote four out of 10 pain on it. So let's look at the, uh, let's look at the precordial leads first. So V1 looks okay, V2. All right, so you have a P wave, and it looks like you have a Q wave here, and then a ST elevation with a huge T wave. That's bad. V3, P wave, huge Q wave, uh, ST elevation, huge T wave. That's bad. Next lead, uh, no Q wave, you have a QRS complex, ST elevation, big T wave, bad. So V2 through V4, and even a little V5, you have ST elevations, but most importantly, hyperacute T waves combined with the ST elevations. <coughs> If you look over here at the non-precordial leads or the limb leads, if you look in mostly AVL, you can see some ST elevation. Now, this is very slight. Not all ST elevations are going to be huge, like, oh, that's an obvious STEMI. So we have the TP segment here, right? This P wave is looking like it's inverted or whatever, but, or no, I guess it's right here. So don't worry about the PR segment at all, but this is the, the baseline, right? So the ST, uh, the ST elevation is roughly a millimeter above it. Um, or even maybe slightly under that, but it's there. Um, and if you look at the opposite lead three, you have ST depressions, right? Now there's a little bit of a baseline wandering here, we call it. So the artifact or the movement of the patient or the breathing of the patient most likely is causing the, you can see it kind of slopes up, right? Like these three beats slope up. So you have to kind of take in the ST segments and baseline, take that into consideration. So the, um, the first baseline is here. There's the ST depression, it's pretty obvious. Now these are the baselines wandering up. So it's kind of hard to tell like this one, if you just had this lead or this like beat to look at, it wouldn't really look so bad. Like the ST segment's not really depressed. Uh, but then once it kind of levels off up here, you start to see it sloping back down, um, but it's more obvious here. So hopefully that makes sense. But your baseline definitely can wander and it can alter your interpretation of the ST segments a little bit. Um, so this is an anterior lateral STEMI. You have obvious ST elevations and hyper -QT waves, and then some lateral changes as well. This ST elevation, by itself, maybe not the most concerning, but when it's reciprocated with ST depressions, you need to be concerned. So anterolateral STEMI, 
uh, pathological Q waves in V2 to V4, which are basically are V2, V3, very deep Q waves. Um, and hyperacute T waves are really bad. Now, the hyperacute T waves are really important because that often means it's an early MI um, or, or one that's rapidly evolving but has not gone on for hours and hours and hours. So then 20 minutes later after the first CKG, there's a resolution of chest pain. So now they're at a 2 out of 10, or sorry, a 1 out of 10. So they're feeling a lot better. Now the ST depression, the ST elevations in V2 through V4 and the hyperQT waves are gone. Um, you have actually they're not gone, but they're they're way less. You have very very slight ST elevation in V2 to V3, um, and it's almost gone in V4. But look at the T waves. So it's going up, and then down, up and then down. This is called a biphasic T wave. And this is representative of reperfusion. So although this is good, the patient's not actively infarcting most likely. Um, this is reperfusion from ischemia or from infarction. So this is bad. It's called Wellen syndrome. So if we look here, it's transient improvement in the ST segment changes with development of biphasic T waves. It's known as Wellen syndrome and indicates reperfusion of a previously occluded LED. So this is why serial EKGs or doing multiple EKGs over a course of time are super important. This patient probably should have gone straight to the cath lab, but for whatever reason they didn't and they got this. So let's keep going. So then five minutes later, five minutes after they're feeling better, if a reoccurrence of chest pain, somebody promptly did an EKG, they're back up to 4 out of 10 pain, and look, it's essentially the same as the first EKG. We went from this, not so scary looking, but it has reperfusion waves, so that's concerning, to this, definitely scary looking. All right, then 10 minutes later, they have ongoing chest pain and diaphoresis again. It's getting worse. Look at the ST segment here. Look at it here. They've gone off by like 3 millimeters, and then V4 is getting worse as well, right? And then the depressions are getting worse over here as well. Um, so yeah, just saying it's an obvious anterior lateral STEMI. And then look at this. This is why it's so important to get really good at interpreting these. Even if it's just like you and your ER shift or, or you and your clinic, you can actually save somebody with these, with, with being um, adept at interpreting EKGs. So this patient was sitting in bed, obviously. They were had ongoing chest pain and diaphoresis. And then shortly after this 35 minute later EKG, they had a ventricular fibrillation arrest, a VF arrest. So they went into cardiac arrest and died um, shortly after this EKG was taken. They were placed on a, probably a Lucas device, which is just like an automated CPR device, and taken to the cath lab, and they had a 100% proximal LED occlusion. She was stented, successfully cardioverted, and made a good neurological recovery. Remember, it's a female patient. Males and females are both at severe risk for MI when they have these changes. And remember, we don't want to sit around and wait until it looks like this. Take them to the cath lab. When, you, when you're seeing these like slight changes that, that suggest occlusion, they need to go. That's that's why there's like STEMI protocols and everything. It's very important to get them uh, reperfused as quickly as possible so they don't go into arrest. All right, number six, 30 year old patient presenting with generalized weakness. So keep that in mind, 30 year old patient, generalized weakness, that's all you know. You handed the EKG and what do you see? So you take like 10 seconds, just look for the most, I don't know, the most weird looking thing between the P like the P wave, QRS, and the ST segment, and the T wave. Okay, so if you look at the rate, just eyeballing it, it looks normal. There's, there's not a whole lot, there's not too little, maybe a little fast. Let's just count it because we can. We start from this one on the black line, 300, 150, 175. Yeah, so it's fine. It's like 70 beats per minute. So. Remember, you can do the algorithm, but once you get pretty quick at looking as if it's regular, irregular, if it's fast, slow, normal, um, you can start glancing quickly at the ST segments, the T waves, and the QRS. Those will tell you a lot. So what I notice here is that in V3 through V6, this ST segment and T wave are looking really funky. So this goes like slopes down and slopes up, slopes down, slopes up a lot. Um, this side over here is not too concerning. You definitely can see that down up over here as well, but it's more subtle. But let's focus on these. So what do we, we see in V3? We have a normal, sorry, we have a normal P wave, P wave, QRS was really an RS complex, which is the ventricular is depolarizing. Then we were, when we would normally see an ST segment and T wave, we see an inverted T wave, but then it comes all the way back up, not to baseline, but over baseline for another positive deflection, and then comes back down where it's followed by a P wave for the next beat. Uh, it's like a V4, QRS, Huge inverted T wave, not huge, but you know, inverted T wave, then a, this huge positive deflection before the next P wave. So what do we call that? QRS T U. 
this is a huge U wave. And it's kind of confusing because it almost looks, if you're not really paying attention, like a big biphasic T wave, but it's not. That would be, look how long this T wave would be. It would be like, if it was a normal T wave, it would be like that long. It's way too long. So there's an inverted T wave and a huge positive U wave following it. So if you have a downward deflection and then an upward deflection after your QRS, that's likely uh, prominent U waves, which is indicative of what if we remember from class. So prominent U waves you can get in bradycardia. This patient is not bradycardic. So hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is going to cause these uh, prominent U waves. Let's look at the explanation really quick. So again, 30 year old patient with generalized weakness. So, whoops. So ST segment abnormalities, obviously. There's the T wave at 22. There's the U wave. The QU interval, which is different than the QT, is really long. Um, and it's highly suggestive of hypokalemia. Now, this is kind of cool because it's tying it into some endocrine stuff here. This patient had a serum potassium of 1.7 millimoles per liter in the context of decompensated con syndrome. So primary aldosteronism. So aldosterone is just going crazy. Um, it's, it's bringing in sodium and it's just kicking out a ton of potassium. It's just spitting out tons of potassium. So you get this severe hypokalemia. Um, it's interesting because we can just correlate what we just learned in endocrine to an EKG change, which if recognized could save the patient's life uh, before you even get labs back. All right, just a couple more here. Um, so number seven, 70 year old patient presenting with chest pain, dyspnea and dizziness, blood pressure of 90 over 50 and a uh, oxygen saturation of 83% of room air. So this patient is not doing well. So imagine walking into a room, 70 year old patient, pretty old. They have chest pain, shortness of breath and dizziness. Their blood pressure is very low and or it's not very low, but it's, it's pretty low. And their um, oxygen saturation is 83% of room air. They're doing really bad. Uh, what are you going to do about it? What's going on? So I'm circling this because this is where you should be looking immediately. Okay, so these are the precordial leads. These go on their chest. V1 through V3 is like the anterior portion of the heart, but specifically it's towards the right side of the heart, right? So what do you notice? We have a P wave. Right, so it's sinus, no, no worries. We have a QRS, and then we have these huge inverted T waves, right? That's bad. Um, so we have inverted T waves, it goes all the way to V4, and then it finally starts to transition to the upward QRS around here. Um, so this is definitely concerning for what on the right side of the heart. So inverted T waves, probably some right-sided heart strain. It's a pretty complicated EKG, so let's just look at the professional interpretation. So sinus tack, which is important. The heart rate's a little fast, but it is sinus. Anterior T wave abnormality, so inverted in V1 through 3, biphasic in V4, like we said. Remember, biphasic, it means it goes up and down. Uh, inferior T wave abnormalities. So remember, right side of the heart's over here. And this is this inferior portion is kind of like the lower right side of the heart, or lower to right side of the heart. We have T wave inversions in 3 and AVF. They're, they're subtle, but they're there. Um, and then some subtle ST elevation in 3 and AVF. So why is this important? So the pattern of T wave inversions in the right precordial leads plus the inferior leads, especially the rightward facing lead three, if you look at the axis, it's, it's over here. It's looking at the right side of the heart directly. So this is referred to as right ventricular strain pattern, the marker of right ventricular hypertrophy or dilatation. Um, so this patient doesn't really have right axis deviation yet, but their right heart is working very hard um, to push against something. Uh, why? So but again, let's just go back. So we know this EKG now represents right ventricular strain. Okay, so let's put that into the context of our patient. So a 70 year old patient presenting with chest pain, shortness of breath and dizziness, low blood pressure, horrible oxygen saturation on room air, plus right ventricular strain on the EKG. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. What could be going on? So it's highly suggestive of a pulmonary embolism. One of the most important things to know uh, for pulmonary embolism on EKGs is sinus tack is the most common thing. There's a couple other things that can show up, but this is the most sensitive and specific, like uh, most sensitive for um, pulmonary embolism, plus obviously the clinical scenario. Um, see, these EKG changes are not specific to pulmonary embolism and may be seen in other conditions. If you see this EKG, you don't immediately think pulmonary embolism, but you put it on your list. You think of things that can cause the right side of the heart to work harder. Um, so chronic lung disease, right ventricular hypertrophy due to congenital causes or valvular heart disease. And then uh, AV or ARVC, I forgot exactly what the acronym is, but it's arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy uh, can cause change like this as well.
a uh, couple more here. Okay, this one is really good and really challenging. Um, so when you look at this, we see this, right? This this should stand out a little bit. The QRS looks super wide, but is it actually super wide or are we dealing with something a little bit more sinister? So if we look at AVL, we can see the QRS a lot more easily than we can over here. If we zoom way in, this is the, like, the P wave-ish area. This is where the QRS is. If we look at it, it's only two boxes long, right? That's not wide. And nothing changes in our rhythm strip down here between here and over here. So we can assume the QRS width is the same over here. Here as is normal here, it should be over here too. So we know it's 80 milliseconds or two little boxes long. So if we look over here and we start calculating it from basically the, the start of the second box here. So we go to the, uh, if this is the end of the first box, the start of the second box, we go to the end of the second box and the end of the third box, right? So this is where the QRS ends. We go all the way down here. Look, this is the end of the QRS. This is the beginning of the ST segment, this right here. This is severe ST depression. It just looks really, really weird. I can call this a shark fin morphology. It looks like a shark fin, all the upside down. You can get this with ST elevations too. It looks like the QRS is really wide, but it's just a very, very uh, depressed or elevated ST segment. So you can kind of see now where the ST segment get, begins. So we have severe ST depression here, 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 here. So V2 through V6, severe ST depression. Inferior leads right there. This is the ST segment, severely depressed. AVF, severely depressed, one, severely depressed. Now, so basically we have ST depression everywhere and AVR has severe, severe ST elevation, like almost five millimeters above. Let's look at our clinical context. 70 year old patient presenting with severe chest pain, diaphoresis and syncope, blood pressure 65 over 40. They're tanking, they're about to, go, they're about to code. Um, so if they have severe chest pain, diaphoresis, syncope and a severely low blood pressure with global ST depressions, and a massive elevation AVR, that's indicative of left main, left main coronary artery occlusion. Now there's a few other things that can cause this, but if you have a left main coronary artery occlusion, you're gonna, you're gonna die pretty quickly afterwards if you don't get it um, opened up. So if we look at this, we have widespread ST depression, like we were saying, um, indistinct J point, uh, it's basically, it's hard to tell exactly where the ST segment begins. Um, there's three millimeters or so ST elevation AVR, um, we kind of already talked about how to calculate where the ST segment actually begins and ends. So this is kind of important. So it's extremely concerning for left main uh, occlusion when you have this ST elevation AVR and ST depression pretty much everywhere else. However, it's not entirely specific. Um, there's other things that can cause it. Severe triple vessel disease, which is where you basically have like uh, occlusions or, or partial occlusions in, off, in multiple places in your heart. Um, severe anemia or hypoxemia. So this is really important because Think about hypoxemia, like let's say your oxygen saturation is 70 for a period of time, or like your hemoglobin is like four. Uh, even though your hearts aren't, your heart vessels aren't occluded, you're going to have severe, um, what's the best way to put it? I guess ischemia, because uh, like basically to the, your entire heart because of the severe anemia or hypoxemia. So even though there's no occlusion, your whole heart's not getting, um, essentially it's not getting oxygen. So it's going to be ischemic and you're going to see these widespread ischemic changes, which is what you see here. Let's just keep moving on. We're almost to 30 minutes, so I want to wrap this up. 55-year-old um, male, or sorry, 55-year-old patient presenting with chest pain. Could be male or female. What do we see here? So if we look at the rhythm strip. It's kind of a regular. We see a beat and a beat, then a pause, then a beat, beat, pause, beat. All right, so this isn't a regular rhythm. But if we look, we see P waves. Um, they're not like, it's not like a third degree AV block. It looks like a first degree AV block. Uh, every QRS has a P wave, except for this one. So we definitely have some funkiness going on with the conduction, but in general, they're mostly sinus rhythm. Um, so these are going to be some PVCs that are thrown in here. Uh, so if you, we're seeing like multi, uh, multifocal PVCs, it looks like this might be like a junctional, um, a junctional, uh, conduction. So we have different parts of the heart conducting. So this heart is kind of irritated for some reason. They have chest pain. Their heart is irritated due to the multiple like ectopy going on here. Their rate is okay. But what do we see in the V1 through V6 leads? There's nothing too exciting going on over here. Um, so V1, we have this funky looking QRS and T wave, uh, whatever. This is probably the, the PVC. Um, we look right here, we have a P wave. We have what looks to be like a Q wave almost with an upright big T wave in V1. That's not normal, this is typically down. V2, let's look at just this beat right here. We have a P wave, first degree V block, Q wave with a huge, huge T wave. So this is not really a peaked T wave. 
uh, peak T wave being more narrow. This is a huge, broad, tall T wave. We call this a hyper-acute T wave, okay? So hyper-acute T waves, this is one as well. Look at the size of it compared to the QRS. It's like double the size of the QRS. That's really bad. Here, it's like triple the size of the QRS. That's really bad. Here, it's like triple the size of the QRS. So hyper-acute T waves are concerning for early MI. Or hyper-acute MI. Or, sorry, hyper-acute T waves are concerning for early MI. So 55-year-old presenting with chest pain, you get handed this EKG, you're worried they're having an MI, and you've caught it kind of early, which is not a bad thing. Um, so we're going to move on. Look at this example of a hyperacute anterolateral STEMI, right? So we're looking here, we see some hyperacute T waves extending all the way out to V6. Even though these are much smaller than these, look at compared to the size of the QRS. It's the exact same size as the QRS. That's bad. Um, also, the associated loss of R wave hype causes the enlarging precordial T waves to tower over the diminishing R waves, right? And then, like I was saying earlier, this heart is irritated due to the ectopy. This is because they're probably having an MI, which, according to our clinical picture in the EKG, they likely are. Um, but if you get a lot of ectopy, that you know, you start to worry that they're going to um, basically, basically deteriorate into like VTAC or VFib. So that's bad. Uh, clinical pearls. Oh, this is cool. So this patient should be um, getting you know, PCI most likely for uh, you know going to the cath lab. But then for whatever reason, this patient had serial EKGs done and they waited. Um, and then look what happens. You know, you go from these hyper acute T waves where you could be catching this MI early. Now you're getting these huge deep Q wave developments, which means that the, the myocardium is infarcted and you have huge ST elevations. This patient is, is at serious risk of, uh, of death. And, and more, you know, I mean, obviously not more importantly than death, but like even if they survive, you're, you're causing long term damage there. Um, so this one you guys can look at later. Uh, this is like a bradycardia, uh, bradycardia due to hypothermia. Um, but this last one I think is a good one to end on. So a middle-aged female presenting with shortness of breath, previous mastectomy for breast carcinoma. What does the ECG show? Middle-aged female, dyspnea, shortness of breath, previous mastectomy for breast carcinoma. What does the ECG show? All right, so what's the rate? It's kind of hard to calculate. There's, there's one on a thick line. 300, 150, 100, it's between 150 and then uh, 100, so let's say 130. So pretty tachycardic, right? Look at the C segments, all the C segments look fine. We know that there are P waves before every QRS, QRS is after every P wave, so this is the sinus tachycardia. And then if we look at the QRS heights, there's something interesting about them. So just take a second and look at them. Right, so it goes up, P wave, P wave, so what's different about this and this and this and this and this and this? They're alternating, right? What do we call this in class? Electrical alternons or alterons. So something is causing the amplitude of each of these QRSs to to like sway, to shift. Um, so if we look at this, we have a, a, a basically a triad of, of very concerning things along with the clinical picture. Sinus tech, low QRS voltage. They're they're not very tall. They're 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 pretty tiny if you compare it to a normal EKG. And electrical alternons is a beat to beat variation in the QRS complex. So, this triad of tachycardia, low QRS voltages, and electrical alternons, what does this suggest, guys? So, massive pericardial effusion. So, the heart is basically swinging around in a thing of fluid. It's causing the QRS voltage to be low because the myocardium can't contract as well. It's causing sinus tachycardia because it has to compensate by, by, by like, you know, to maintain blood flow, it has to pump more times with less uh, stroke volume. And then uh, you have electrical alternons because of the heart is like actually swinging. Um, and, th and that's pretty much it. Um, you know, there's about a hundred of these, I believe. Uh, if you go to top 100, you can do those. Now there's also um, clinical cases, which are amazing. Like they, they not only do EKGs, but they also like uh, can do like toxicology and um, you know, they just kind of correlate everything together. Looks like these are all tox cases, but they're on here as well. And then don't forget to go to EKG library and work through all the ECG basics. Um, they're really amazing at just breaking down everything, you know, from each of the different waves to the different segments, uh, how to calculate that axis, which I've kind of already gone into. Uh, and then, you know, here's some more clinical things. We have MI localization. It's just a, a really great website. So hopefully this was helpful. It starts a little bit longer, but it takes a little bit more time to like correlate it to clinical scenarios. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, let me know. And this is probably going to be the last video for a while unless there's something specific I should make it on. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks.